So welcome, welcome to this session. Um, we will be focusing for the next 45 minutes on developing the business global compact. I'm delighted to have a wonderful panel joining me here and will be introduced. change makers to actually implement these innovation and um, technologies. As I said, this panel focuses on developing the Business Global Compact. And according to the UN, this is the world's largest sustainability initiative. It's a call to companies to align strategies and operations with universal principles on human rights, labor, environment, and anti-corruption, and take actions that advance societal goals. The Compact aims to drive change across all aspects of corporate sustainability and aims also to support the achievement of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. It has six focus areas, namely environment, social, government, sustainable development, sustainable finance and supply chain. And we're going to discuss the Global Compact and uh, its implications and what needs to be done, also implications of the pandemic, uh, with a wonderful panel that I'm very proud to introduce now. Uh, starting with Craig, Craig Kilberger, who is co-founder of WE from the US, uh, Canada, sorry, Craig, for that. Uh, we have Maxim, Maxim Nogotkov, founder Svaznoy, a group of companies all based in the US. We have Ryan Villanueva, CEO of Best Delegate, and Mark Verissimo, executive chairman of Lighter Capital. But you'll all talk more about what you're doing, uh, your companies, and in particular, how this relates to the global compact. So, what I'll ask you now is to briefly introduce yourself uh, in a couple of words, really to kick off the discussion already, and I'll talk a little bit about your connection to today's topic. And since, you know, Craig, I uh, put you in the wrong country, you are <laughs> you're the first to go. <laughs> so please get started. Of course, Julia, thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, so we.org started uh, 26 years ago now. It was uh, created by some friends of myself, and we have a couple divisions to our work. We're a proud uh, Global Compact member. Uh, we uh, work in uh, North America and the UK, engaging young people to better understand issues of sustainable development. And so we have about 15,000 schools that have operated curricular resources that we provide. And for the Americans who are uh, watching, we have a, for example, partnership with the College Board, where we program uh, AP with We Service. So you do service learning to complete your coursework, and it's the only on transcript recognition of service when you graduate. Uh, globally, in nine developing countries, uh, clean water, healthcare, education, sustainable development, helping to empower communities. And I suppose the last thing I would say is we both implement projects, but why um, we ended up working so closely actually with the Global Compact is because we also uh, provide almost a white label solution to companies who are interested to implement uh, their own sustainability, their own social development plan. So we found a very interesting opportunity for uh, the, the nonprofit sector and the for-profit sector to partner and to deliver holistic solutions, almost like um, a company would subcontract their technology needs to actually to partner and subcontract their their social impact uh, to a charitable partner. So it's been extraordinary to work with companies from Virgin to KPMG, from um, you know uh, Allstate to, uh, uh, my goodness, some of the largest companies of Microsoft, et cetera, around the world to do these type of works. It's um, It's been an extraordinary journey. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks a lot, Craig. And I, we will go back and talk a little bit about, you know, what you do concretely and some of your case studies as we as we continue with this discussion. Maxim, I'll hand over to you. Yes. Uh, hi. So I spent uh, 20 years of my career and in retail and fintech and built a few unicorns. And I was involved in a couple of nonprofits, uh, participatory democracy, uh, participatory budgeting, and another one, uh, land art festivals, like Russian version of Burning Man. Uh, <laughs> and in the last in the last year, I'm transitioning. Uh, so I moved to US and I'm transitioning to the topics I'm, I'm mostly interested in now. And uh, I spent last year in um, as a part of the team uh, launching fund of funds uh, for social impact projects. And uh, currently, my another interest uh, and another project I'm I'm starting up is uh, focused on holistic health. So these are two two of my interests linked to the topic. Mm -hmm. Okay, did I get this right? Holistic health. 
Mark Sin. Holistic health, health yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks a lot. Mark, please. Um, yeah, I've, I spent um, 35 years in Silicon Valley in the entrepreneurial ecosystem, both there and also the UK, China, Israel, and India. Um, after retiring from Silicon Valley Bank uh, five years ago, I moved over to the, to the board and consulting side. So currently I sit on four boards, um, three of which, one is a bank, two are fintech companies, clearly deal a lot with with um, some of the companies are doing, their business plan is connected to the compact. Um, but probably where I at least initially most focused on it is I'm also trustee for the uh, UC Davis Foundation, U University Foundation. And so we this past year have actually done a lot of work with our investment policy, et cetera, to align with the compact. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. We'll be talking about that as well. And Ryan. Great. Thank you, Julia. Um, I'm the co-founder of a company called Best Delegate. It's a K-12 education company here in the United States. And we create student leaders who solve global problems. We specialize in an activity called Model United Nations. So we organize Model UN conferences and summer camps and uh, online resources. And our online resources and virtual trainings have reached um, 5 million users over the last 10 years. Uh, and the company started as a blog that I launched out of my dorm room uh, 10 years ago. And it's grown to be the world's leading resource for learning Model UN. Um, and so we teach students about the work of the United Nations. We teach them about the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, but the reason why I'm here on this panel actually is on behalf of the Entrepreneurs Organization, EO. So we're a group of 14,000 um, business owners um, with uh, a minimum requirement of a million annual revenue. Run rate averages 5 million across member businesses. And uh, within the organization, I'm the uh, champion um, for the United Nations uh, and social impact. And so within EO, my role is to promote social impact, sustainability, to educate other business owners and entrepreneurs about the SDGs, and to build our partnership with the United Nations, uh, including the UN Global Compact. So over the last year, we've actually organized a number of events with the UN Global Compact to help them develop resources to reach more entrepreneurs, because I believe, and many of us believe, that entrepreneurs will be critical to solving the world's biggest problems, starting mm -hmm. with the SDGs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Thanks a lot. So I already see, you know, some synergies between uh, what all of you have been saying. And I'd now like to dive a little deeper into, you know, what you're doing concretely. And um, I would want to start with you, Ryan and Craig, because you're also working a lot, you know, with students, young entrepreneurs, uh, really also the next generation and um, asking you to provide some very concrete examples, case studies, so that it's becoming very clear for everyone listening, you know, how you go about your work and how you actually try to, to bring this across and also to, you know, to train this, this next generation. resources for young people um, and then on the uh, global um, uh, global south uh, we have about uh, 1500 schools and school houses we built and clean water medical for a million people and, and 30,000 small uh, businesses run by women entrepreneurs in the communities where they work around the world and and so how how tangibly we work within the global compact world within this is we'll team up with uh, corporate partners who want to do good. So take an example, uh, for example, Virgin Atlantic uh, for years, an extraordinary partner. And so when customers fly in the, I realize impacts of COVID, they're not flying as much, but when customers were flying at, at, a, at a different level, uh, dropping their coins on board, we would then implement the project for that partner. And what that would look like, it ranged from, uh, you know, educating the customer with education, clean water and sanitation, healthcare, food security, and job creation. We would work on the duty-free catalog. So we created items that the customers could purchase aboard. They were handmade by women artisans. So a, a specific piece that came from the Massey Mara region, hand-beaded by women, empowering their families to lift themselves out of poverty. 
the upper class uh, chocolate we were able to source from a co-ops that we established. So chocolate that changed lives. So from women owned uh, um, co-ops in the cacao fields of actually South America and Ecuador is where it came from. We were able to build opportunities for a virgin team members to engage in service trips where they would go overseas with us and roll up their sleeves and help build and teach and serve and learn about sustainable development. And Sir Branson, for example, came and others um, and even uh, contesting opportunities for their clients. And then around Gatwick, where their main station is located, we had Virgin team members going into schools to do STEM education and global citizenship education to teach in local schools where this all came alive. Um, And so through that process, they supported from Ghana to Kenya, from India to uh, South America, uh, villages um, that were the the recipient of their funding. But they also had a local activation program in UK schools where they're educating youth about sustainable development. And about one in four Virgin Atlantic employees engaged with with us through that type of service, hands-on, uh, making an impact either local in the UK or global in the developing South. And so those are the type of you know tangible opportunities where we see companies aligning not only traditional giving, but how to align their product, how to align their, um, their, their brand, how to align their people, uh, how to align their social impact for that type of maximum good allied global compact um, and, and, and seeing the power of companies to drive for sustainable development. Can I just have a follow-up question? So how do you devise the program? How does that work? Um, is sure. this something that you come up with? Do you have consultation? Is this, you know, do you take on ideas from, from outside? So how does it how does it function? Yeah, and so we have a team in-house. We call them experience architects. So they mm-hmm. sit down with a partner and they always take them through a journey that has four steps. And so we, we do look at uh, their product. So how do you leverage the product to be a force for good? Their people. So how do you leverage both the customers and their employees to be a force for good? Their brand. What is the message? What's the call to action are they putting out to their consumer base? And lastly, what is the fundamental social good? What is the tangible m and based outcome that they want to achieve that we can look at? And so we walk them through this um, because typically, so again, as context, 26 years ago, we started this charity Mm -hmm. where we were very like any other charity with, you know, fundraising and, you know, people, you know, holiday gift catalogs and all that. Um, And then we realized that companies were this extraordinary opportunity where they were looking to do good and they were just handing over a check. And that was so limited in the positive impact on the SDGs, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. And so we started to walk them through this where we realized what we basically built was a platform and they could on that platform leverage whatever is their cause. So again, with Microsoft, it's youth coding for good. With Walgreens Boots Alliance, it was trauma-informed classrooms looking Mm -hmm. at mental health with well-being. You know, with KPMG, it was uh, KPMG's Families for Literacy. So they still kept their core cause. In Mm -hmm. fact, in most cases, you don't even know that we're powering it as a -hmm. back-end white-label provider. But we saw this really interesting opportunity where companies don't need to recreate the wheel. Mm -hmm. And charities who are actually looking for the amplification power of great companies could come together to achieve this type of scale of impact. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think that's an interesting notion of you know having to reinvent the wheel, but actually to look at and to stay true true to your core and to your core activity. Um, Ryan, um, can you talk a little bit about both the work that you're doing in terms of modeling the UN, you know, and having sure. a very strong education element there, but also uh, with the entrepreneurial association or organization? Of course, of course. So, uh, model UN is a global activity. Estimated half a million students a year participate from grades three, U.S. grade three, to uh, all the way through university. And in model UN, students get to step into the shoes of world leaders. They role play UN diplomats attending a UN conference to solve uh, an issue ranging from. Uh, poverty, gender equality, human rights, climate action, and to write UN resolutions about the issues. Mm-hmm. So they have to learn how to research the topic. They have to research a country's point of view, a country policy. They have to collaborate typically with people for the first time. So they learn these wonderful skills in teamwork and leadership through the activity. And at the end of it, the really cool opportunity is they write these resolutions representing their research and their country's point of view. But then there's an opportunity to tie it back to how does this topic impact my community, my family, Mm -hmm. my school, Mm -hmm. Uh, what is the opportunity to make an impact there? And that's where we can make a connection with uh, service learning, which Craig actually brought up. Um, And so Maldi is a wonderful activity for teaching students about student uh, global issues. And specifically what my company does is we um, organize conferences and summer camps around this. And we also consult for schools, um, governments, and even the United Nations around this activity. 
uh, one project uh, was with a, a Middle Eastern government, actually, in their National Ministry of Education, where we um, aligned Model UN against their national education strategy, which was in alignment with the SDGs. We trained like 50 of their teachers and developed a plan for them to roll out Model UN programming and organized conferences across every single government school in the country over the next 10 years, um, all in alignment again with where they were trying to go with SDG four and quality education. And as a business, we teach the SDGs, but also at the same time have had to integrate the SDGs into our business. And so mm-hmm. we are very strongly mission aligned to target 4.7 specifically on, on yeah. citizenship education. And I've done all this in my business. I already con- I consult for other business owners as well. Actually, some I do business consulting on the side. And then with within EO, within the entrepreneurs organization, there's a growing movement of small business owners who believe that sustainability and social impact needs to be integrated into our business. And an interesting thing that that Craig brought up is that for most businesses and business owners, they think of it philanthropically, like I'm writing a check and I'm mm-hmm. handing this off, or it's a, vol- it's a volunteer kind of opportunity, engagement opportunity. One of the things I've been trying to promote within EO is the idea of how do we integrate impact into the business model? How do mm-hmm. we create both economic value and social value simultaneously? And that's part of a, a Harvard Business School framework called creating shared value. That's something I've been trying to promote within, within EO. And that's the context, actually, of our partnership with the UN Global Compact. Mm-hmm. So in recent, um, uh, in the past year, we've been working with the UN Global Compact with designing resources that are practical and concrete and helpful to a small business owner where they can actually integrate sustainability and social impact and the SDGs into their business and actually leverage it as an opportunity to create, um, to improve the business model. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's been a really interesting, like ongoing discussion and, and part of the work that I've been doing within, within EO. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks a lot, Ryan. Um, Mark, I'd like to move on to you. So you've spent, you know, 20 years in Silicon Valley and uh, now you're sitting here and talking about the UN Global Compact. I think that's probably a very interesting journey. So I wonder if you yeah. can talk a little bit about this. Uh, yeah, I mean, clearly, if you go back to the late 70s, early 80s, when I started, uh, it wasn't on anybody's radar screen. Um, as far as a social compact with the companies and the communities they serve, it was mainly return. Return to shareholders is very myopic. And then certainly working for a public company um, for almost 25 years, Silicon Valley Bank, um, at senior management levels, we were again focused on return to shareholders. Um, but clearly that has changed or there's been a shifting um, view of what companies are responsible for and who stakeholders are in them. And probably I would talk most specifically about the UC Davis Foundation, because that's where we had to do something over this past year. We've rewritten our investment policy because we're we're under the umbrella of the UC Regents, which is about $150, $160 billion endowment, but we control our piece of it. And so part of it was we're looking to see what the Regents were doing. And clearly they were being guided by their stakeholders, by the UN compact as to investing decisions. And so we looked at our policy, which originally was set up about 12 years ago, 12, 13 years ago. And it was very return oriented, period. I mean, that's what we worried about is Mm -hmm. getting return and delivering value to the university. And we looked at it and said, we need to expand that and we need to bring in ESG and we need to bring in DNI, diversity and inclusion into it. Mm -hmm. And we got resistance um, from people because they said, geez, we're fiduciaries for this money that's been given to us. We need to maximize return and minimize risk. And that's it. Mm -hmm. And so I found that for me to get over the hurdle or to get them over the hurdle, we had to talk about the issues of how worrying about ESG principles, diversity, inclusion is actually good business Mm. and going beyond just the stats, which people argue about stats, but saying, listen, somebody who's really involved in sustainability, ESG, all communities probably is better insulated against reputation damage, better insulated against government reactions or what government's going to be doing to you and, and supply chain issues, et cetera. So, Mm. We just think it's good business and those companies should return 
at least or superior returns to companies that don't pay any attention to it. Diversity inclusion, we also inserted language because people start to think quotas, affirmative action, they get very negative views of saying, no, what you want to do is get entities that have a lot of diverse opinions around the table and listen to them tend to come up with better solutions than people that have all the people that look the same, talk the same, et cetera. They don't see the world through the different prisms that you need to see it. So we we had pretty robust discussions. And at the end, we ended up with a policy that aligns closely to the UN compact, mm -hmm. which was what we were shooting for. And we got everybody over the finish line. And, you know, to me, you had to bring them in and get them part of the discussion and not feeling that their views were discounted, mm -hmm. but more that their views were actually being amplified by what we were doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. It's I think it's an interesting learning, you know, that you 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 need to speak a language, right? That's under, that can be understood, and you know, not not trying to sort of preach in terms that seem you know uh, very foreign actually to to the companies or to the ones that you actually want to you know uh, make changes. Um, Maxim, you spoke about holistic health. I think that's a very important expression. So, you know, um, holistic approaches overall. Um, you know, I, when I hear holistic, I also think about interconnectedness, interconnectedness of different challenges, interconnectedness also when it comes to the SDGs, you know, that the global company wants to contribute to. Um, and you spoke about your work um, around social impact projects. So I wonder whether you can also dive in a little more um, and talk to about as about what this entails concretely and maybe also what uh, challenges are that you are facing have been facing um, in this uh, in this realm um, the projects i'm working uh, on now are in uh, pre-launch phase uh, so i can i can only speak about challenges and uh, what i'm anticipating and mm -hmm. my, my biggest challenge is uh, I'm working on a new type of social structure, which which is a hybrid between the community and a fund of funds, for example, or between a community and marketplace of holistic practitioners. And I'm I'm struggling a little bit because normally communities they don't uh, act in a focused way, so they normally um, are just uh, exchanging knowledge, and I'm trying to create a hybrid a structure which would be, which would create the feeling of um, everybody doing the same thing and say building the building the cathedral, but at the same time keeping independence with builders, investors, and this is this is my biggest challenge right now, and this is what I'm trying to invent. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether I see Craig nodding. Craig, whether you would have any advice or anything. Well, I was intrigued by it, actually, to be candid, why I was nodding. I, I think it's a very interesting idea. You're talking about building a, a different type of social movement. So I was I was more intrigued to hear more, frankly. Can you talk more, Maxim, about it? I think we're all intrigued. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's work in progress. So I have some ideas. Um, I think that uh, the closest... Um, It's, it's 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 both a work on um, it, it's a lot of work with culture so it's 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 a lot of work and uh, attention to like personal coaching and this these type of things for the people I I, th I think um, the future the future um, is with networks so the corporations and other social structures like nation states they will they will reduce their power and the power of networks will be much, much higher in 10, 15, 20 years. But these networks currently, they are not uh, organized. Uh, for example, if you talk about SDGs, uh, you have a structure of outcomes. You have 169 uh, outcomes structured by United Nations, but action uh, and projects and leaders are not organized Uh, as they would be in, in a corporation. So in corporation, you would have KPIs, you would have uh, goals, you would have people responsible for that. Uh, and nobody does this work now. Uh, and, it, and it couldn't be done uh, in a corporation type of format because 
people want their freedom and they want their independence and they want to do their own thing. But somehow this coordination is needed. Uh, and uh, the thing I'm working on is a new type of network which allows such coordination. It, it's, it's difficult to explain in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I think it sounds cool. I encourage everyone to follow up with you individually afterwards, Maxime. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What I find interesting, if I could just pipe in to say, is you often hear people speak idealistically about these type of things. And what I find fascinating is that you actually have the ability that, you know, we're all familiar with your background here. You, you, you've built extraordinary companies and you've scaled them in the past. So it's, it's one thing for people to talk idealistically about social movements who have never done it. And then it's another thing when, when you talk about that way and you have a, you know, a, a very well-established track record of building and scaling large-scale companies and, 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 and system-level changes as you have in the past. So, so I, I find it interesting, that level of idealism with a track record of entrepreneurial you know, success and operational expertise, combining them together. I, I am genuinely intrigued to see how this will look in time. So, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Craig. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. <laughs> Um, I would like to talk a little bit about last year, or oh, well, we're still in it, right? I mean, we should talk about the pandemic and what kind of implications this has had on, you know, moving closer to the realization, for instance, of the UN SDGs and also, you know, for the development of the business globe. With Ryan, how did you experience this, these years of 2020, 21? So for my own business, COVID had a huge impact because our primary business was hosting in-person summer camps and conferences. And clearly we couldn't do that anymore. Literally this time a year ago, I was at the largest model UN conference in the world with like 5,000 students speaking at the, at the United Nations. And then the next week, like everything just shut down. Um, and as a again, small business owner and entrepreneur I had to very quickly go into like survival mode. Mm -hmm. um, in my prior life before becoming an entrepreneur, I actually was on wall street. I actually worked at, I was at Goldman Sachs um, where my job was liquidity risk management. And that was in 2008, like right as the global financial crisis hit. So I remember what that was like to be there and like what the firm went through. And I was literally in the corporate treasury group that was responsible for managing that risk. And I remember what we did at the time was we came up with a liquidity playbook, like what we needed to do to just generate cash and survive. And I was able to take that corporate experience and bring it into my small business and mm -hmm. like do what we needed to do to survive the pandemic and then pivot. And very quickly, we did what I think a lot of other organizations did is we went into virtual. Um, as a company, we'd already been operating remotely you know, throughout our life, but now all our programming, we need to deliver virtually. And what we found is that our content and our approach and our methodology and Model UN is actually really engaging online. That's mm -hmm. actually great. And we were able to turn our in-person summer camps into virtual summer camps and then actually leverage it as a business opportunity to create even more virtual programming year round, which we hadn't done before. Um, and on top of that, like the prevalence of global issues and the importance of sustainability was just now like you could not neglect it like mm -hmm. top of everybody's mind and all of our students and their families are faced with COVID and they want to talk about what are world leaders doing about this issue. And they're finding a hard time to discuss that in schools, but model UN and other activities like ours, give them an outlet to research that, to understand that, to talk about it knowledgeably. Um, and more importantly, to connect with other children, with other students, mm -hmm. Um, around that issue. And so COVID has definitely been tough for myself as a business and other fellow business owners within the entrepreneurs organization. But I found that a lot of us, you know, what made us entrepreneurs is a degree of resilience mm -hmm. and ability to like figure out here's the situation. How do we, what do we need to do to survive? And then how do we flip this into uh, to the best extent that we can in opportunity and actually use it as a way to like evolve the business. And that's actually what's happened to my own, my own business. Mm. And I will say within EO amongst business owners, like sustainability is, and social impact is more and more of a conversation. It's just obviously become more important. And mm -hmm. so we, we're finding more and more members like want to talk about this stuff. They want to get engaged with it. And because we're mm -hmm. talking about this is about the United States, like, you know, nine months ago was Black Lives Matter movement. And 
you know, right now we're having a conversation around like Asian American, uh, the Asian American community, diversity and conclusion is becoming like a bigger and bigger conversation mm-hmm. in the organization. And mm-hmm. I think all of this is becoming top of mind and everybody needs an outlet by which to discuss this and take action in it in a responsible way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, Mark, how did you experience this from the foundation in particular? Um, well, the foundation, we, we already had this on our plan to do this. So the pandemic <clears throat> didn't really adjust that much, but I think what the pandemic did do and, um, You know, when I worked at Silicon Valley Bank, one of the things I had underneath me was risk management, and that included scenario planning. Mm-hmm. And we always had our pandemic scenario because we had to do it because the regulators told us we had to do it. Um, and we never paid – we paid some attention to it, but we really didn't take it seriously because we didn't think at this point in evolution that we could have something that brings us to our knees – So what that did do, certainly at the foundation level, but all the companies I had, is everybody started to look very seriously at how we how they did business, why they did it the way they did, what supply chains they may or may not have worried about. And that caused a whole series of actions at all the companies that I that I dealt with and also the companies we fi- financed. Mm-hmm. And at the foundation, it made it an easier argument to those that said, geez, ESG and DNI don't add to return because we said, look at the pandemic and look at what it's done. We have to think of different ways of doing things and things that are more sustainable and resilient mm-hmm. to whether it's climate issues, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you name it. And so it, it did make it easier. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maxime, your your ventures in particular, you know, regarding the impact funds, etc., and the platform that you're talking about are rather are rather new, right? It's rather recent. So I wonder whether the pandemic has had any impact, you know, in your ideas of developing this, or whether it has been, you know, maybe even uh, sort of the, the trigger. Yeah, yeah, I had very uh, strange experience with uh, California uh, authorities. So they just uh, went on. I can say for three months. So they, like, fr- from March till June, they, they didn't do anything, like even online calls. Um, like permitting department for, for the building we, we have in uh, Menlo Park in Silicon Valley. Uh, so I had strange experience, like, of everything slowing down uh, in the government, in the local government, in the local government. Um, uh, overall, my feelings of pandemic uh, are mostly positive, to be honest, uh, just because I think it makes uh, the world more united and it's like destroys the boundaries, like the local locality. Mm-hmm. So it decreases uh, travel and also it creates the feeling that uh, countries, uh, it's very difficult to become isolated in today's world. And if the prob- and this is one of the few global problems which Uh, helps us unite, uh, helps countries unite. So this this potential was not <clears throat> fully uh, explored and realized this time, but hopefully next time will be better. Let's hope. Yeah. Craig, you are working with a very broad variety of, of stakeholders, of companies, you know, around the world. So I'm wondering how did you experience these interactions, did they change? Did priorities change? Was funding suddenly an issue or was it, or was it, you know, was the contrary the case, you know, was there a realization that it's even more important than it was before? So how, how did this um, work out in, in this last couple of months? Well, our, our name is uh, we.org. So we very much depended on people <laughs> coming together. And that was uh, a challenge over the past year to say the least. Uh, so I, I'd say the, The impact, to answer your question on two levels, one as it relates directly to us and then two more broadly on the SDGs, the impact on us was was very significant and and, and frankly uh, similar to what we heard in you know in Model UN events, for example, created a, a requirement to strongly pivot. So, for example, uh, you know, we organized on an annual basis of live events that would bring together roughly 20 stadiums a year 
we would mm -hmm. fill as part of what we did these what were called we days uh, and so they would bring together um, you know a quarter million youth or so and and those live events quickly came to an end um, we found challenges in global travel where we did you know service placements around the world we found challenges of uh, retail partners who were retailing handmade items made by women artisans around the world that quickly was impacted where a lot of mall-based retailers of course struggled we found it even in unusual ways one of the things we run is a a line of, of women-owned coffee co-ops. And uh, we had created a partnership with Keurig, for those of you know who those little cups, uh, and we had to minimize the fluctuation of consumer change. We had partnered with companies so that was in-office coffee services. And of course, suddenly people stopped going in office. And so you have this extraordinary amount of coffee being produced and your, your distribution channel being absolutely devastated. Mm -hmm. So it created an enormous, um, you know, kind of winner and loser mentality with companies. And it was the same on social impact. You know, on a global level, we found, you know, we operated a hospital. So we had to find a primary, secondary, tertiary, everything was shut. And so how do you continue to serve students in those challenging mm -hmm. environments? So an entire shift. The, the one thing I, I'd say that was interesting for us that um, was maybe not talked about, because we talked about sustainability, we've talked about other factors. For us, the, the, the number one request in, in a developed world context that we received was actually on mental health resources and mm -hmm. support. Mm -hmm. which we haven't talked that much about. And we normally don't associate with the SDGs that dramatically. Mm -hmm. but, but I think for this, we saw it rise. And we've now been building a lot of curricular resources for schools and students in that area. And then on the global south, we've talked about it through the lens of how this impacts health. But we often forget that you know, what we saw in the developing countries we serve is a greater impact on food security than it was on health, um, a greater impact on loss of jobs and the movement of people and you know, the economic implications more than it was on a loss of life in COVID-19. So I, I think that, you know, now that we're leaving the immediacy of kind of the phase one of, you know, vaccines are being deployed, etc. We now need to look at what are the other impacts that this has had on, on mental health, on food security, mm -hmm. on, on the, the, the domino impacts of how we have to look at, you know, sustainable development writ large. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that we're taking a, a larger lens than what we have done in the past, right? Um, we have another eight minutes left, I think, and we need to finish on time. So what I would like to do now is for this last round of interaction to really focus on future priorities, because we're, we're talking about developing the, you know, the global compact. So, you know, how can we make sure that it, you know, that talk is being translated into action? So what are the activities and actions that you think are required to move forward and to really, you know, support change, trigger change on a much more massive level than what we have seen before in order also to make, you know, significant progress when it comes to achieving the SDGs, because we all know that the pandemic has, you know, um, had huge and massive uh, negative implications on this. So if you could spend, you know, the last minutes thinking about what do you want participants to take away from, but also what are the things that you Want us, for instance, you know, in the summary of this event, to to keep and to and to and to defend when speaking uh, about what really needs to be done. So, um, I'm opening the round with Ryan. Ryan, what are priorities? Where do we need to really move forward and make changes? So, I feel like I'm taking on the perspective of the SMEs, SMBs, like just for small business owners, which makes up most businesses like around the world. I think for most sustainability the SDGs is still too abstract mm -hmm. it's like too conceptual and it's like it sounds great but it, how does this really impact me in my business and frankly like I'm trying to make a living I'm trying to feed my family or you know honestly I'm trying to grow my own wealth as a small business owner why should I care about this stuff and I think there needs to be more around like the business case for this so I think mm -hmm. Craig has hit on this um, Mark has, has hit on this um in terms of aligning like why this matters with why it matters to our, our businesses and how, again, do we create social value and social impact and integrate it with business value and economic value and financial mm -hmm. value and do it simultaneously. I think it needs to go from being something that's conceptual to being something that's practical. That it's like, mm -hmm. here's, here are tools that I can give to you as a fellow small business owner that you can either DIY, you do it yourself and can implement tomorrow, or even better, give it to someone on your team and they'll mm -hmm. 
start implementing it and doing it. And more importantly, here's how to communicate it out and like how this will help you Mm -hmm. in a very concrete sense when it comes to marketing, sales, operations, financial management. And that's the context of my work and EO's work with the UN Global Compact. We are trying to create those resources Mm -hmm. that will get business owners to get it in a way that they can integrate sustainability concretely into their businesses. Yeah. So I take away being very concrete, being very hands-on and really making sure that there, this translation work is actually happening. Absolutely. Yeah. Maxim, what needs to happen? <clears throat> I, I've heard from uh, the network of accelerators in Africa. So I, I spoke with a couple of ladies in December in Dubai and I asked, the, I asked them the same question and the answer surprised me. So they told me that uh, people in Africa, the, the most important thing for them is faith in themselves. So they are, mm-hmm. so they are ready and open to do everything themselves, and they they don't like too much, uh, like mentoring white men coming to them. So it's uh, so I was surprised by this answer, and I think it's it's very important that uh, people. Uh, have faith, faith in themselves. They are connected to their hearts, and they do the things, even if it's small business. Mm-hmm. They, when, when they faced a controversial decision, mm-hmm. they they just keep this framework of SDGs in in mind, and so mm-hmm. they from their heart rather than from their more selfish interests. Mm-hmm. So I think it's more about culture for me rather than anything else. Yeah, thanks a lot. I like that. I like that you brought the culture in at the end of this. Um, Mark, what is it that is required according to you? Um, well, I would echo what Ryan said regarding small, medium businesses. The larger businesses, um, they feel a lot of pressure because they've got stakeholders, they've got government, and they've got their brand. And it's just um, they don't want tweets, they don't want to be canceled. You know, even coming from Silicon Valley Bank, which is now probably the by market cap, you know, the 15th largest bank in the country. There's a lot of pressures pushing them in that direction. Mm-hmm. So they'll do it. The issues with the SMEs, they're smaller. And like Ryan said, they usually they're survival. They're trying mm-hmm. to survive. So they need real tools and tools that show them this is good for their business. Mm-hmm. It's not some esoteric. Um, as some people would say here in the States, the elites telling them what to do. Mm-hmm. It's knowing you're doing this because it makes your business more uh, more resilient to change, um, pressurizes to change, allows it to grow in a responsible way, which actually becomes more consistent growth rather than jerking around. So I would echo that, echo that mm-hmm. the more that we can put something more concrete things that they can look at to do Mm -hmm. and it's justified from a business sense Mm -hmm. and not this sort of macro very high level it's it's a it's a moral thing to do because small businesses are trying to survive Mm. yeah speaking very clear languages yes and getting the, the message across craig you're having the final words i would simply say governments are maxed given the COVID response, record levels of debt, they're going to not be able to do the international development uh, at the necessary levels. Individuals have been pushed to the brink also in in our country, for example, in Canada. Institutions and today it's the skyscrapers of business. Um, we need companies, small, medium, and large, to see the global compact and to create their own action plan. Very tangible, real, meaningful. Um, the needs are enormous, and those who are watching hopefully are willing to step into those needs. Yeah. I think this was a wonderful conclusion for today's panel. Thank you, Craig. I couldn't have said it any better. So let's be tangible. Let's be impactful. Let's be meaningful. I thank you, my panelists, for being, you know, very clear, very straight to the point, um, very open to the discussion. I wish we had more time, <laughs> frankly. So I hope, you know, that there will be a way to actually continue the discussion. But thanks to all of you for your work, um, which is extremely valuable. Thank you. And I hope you'll get the chance to enjoy some more of, uh, of this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. Thank you for moderating us. Excellent. Pleasure. (laughs) Bye.